we have the same problem that we have clicks only after we start the campaign, but there's something else happening now. If you really want me to optimize clicks, please don't. It's a really bad idea because here's the secret to a perfect click-through campaign. Just show the ad on the Flashlight app. It's people fumbling in the dark. They will click on it eventually. That doesn't mean they are even remotely interested in your product. So click is a terrible metric. Now, here's the irony of this, uh, what I describe as big data killed the metric. Click used to be a reasonably good metric because even if 90% of the clicks were entirely unintentional or random, if at least 10 of them are meaningful and you find a separate population where it's 15%, meaning a higher group, you'd still find people who are more interested because the intentional clicked on this. So as a metric, it works just fine until you let me optimize it. Because if you let me optimize it and now I can use big data and all this kind of interesting um, information I can gather, I will very soon be able to find structure in these 90% unintentional. And so I will find you people who have eyesight problems <laughs> or kind of motor control issues <laughs> or people on the flashlight app, none of which is any more interested in your product. And that's an interesting paradox if you think about it. Things we used to measure very well become gameable in the day and age of big data where you can find structure. So, okay, who cares about the ad anyway? Let's, let's leave the question of whether or not the person saw an ad aside. How about we predict something else that we can see more of? For instance, good, you're not going to buy your Tesla online, but maybe you'll schedule a test drive online, and that I can see. So one way to deal with this is trying to get a more prevalent target by looking at correlated actions, and I hope I convinced you that click is not a correlated action. Turns out these things are better correlated, but they're also much easier gamed. So are the clicks, by the way. And one thing we found when we built those um, models that all of a sudden the performance of our ability to predict who will sign up for test drives got really, really good. And if your performance gets really good in advertising, you should start to get worried. Um, what turns out is there weren't real people signing up for test drives. There were bots. Um, now, what I really need at this point is a model that detects who is a bot. Now, I can hardly show a capture every time before I load the page or try to show you an ad. That would be pretty annoying. So how can I tell whether an entity is a bot? And here, what we then ended up doing is some kind of a network analysis tool. This is a footprint of a bot traffic network, and what you see is a single bot which poses as a person as a cookie visiting many, many websites. And a red point here is a URL, and a line between it means that this cookie is seen on both sides within a very short period. People don't behave like that. They are not that active and they are not so centralized looking at the same kind of density. All right, now let's step back. Let's, let me not try to game the system and optimize what you foolishly ask me to, foolish, uh, to uh, optimize towards. If you really take advertising seriously, who should you show an ad to? Not the person who buys, not the person who clicks, not the bot who fell, uh, filled out the schedule a test drive. It's really the person who is most affected by the ad, whose behavior is changed because of seeing the ad. If the ad doesn't matter, you're completely wasting your money. Now, how about this as a target variable? I want to predict who is most affected by seeing the ad. This is not even a matter of big data or expensive data. This is just philosophically impossible because you can never measure the impact on a single person. Because either you show me the ad or you don't. But you can't have it both ways unless you have a time machine. And last time I checked, most people don't. So you will never be able to observe the target variable that you're really interested in here. So 
you can't have it both ways, so this thing is hopeless. What isn't hopeless, however, is to change the problem and say, okay, how about I build two separate models? One against what happens with the ad, and one what happens without the ad. It will not be the identical person, obviously they're separate people, and that's the foundation of all the very interesting uh, recent work in observational causal methods that lets you estimate causal effects or even optimize towards causal effects using traditional machine learning or predictive modeling as kind of tools in here. So I can optimize towards to it if I had those two models. Now today, nobody in advertising seems to be interested in this product offering, so I'm still waiting. Let me know if you want to give this a shot. Um, you can also use it to measure impact, and this is some kind of a study where we looked at using models that predict what would have happened to see what the ad impact can be. And you see here a vast difference between how creatives affect people in retargeting. Retargeting means you already looked at the product. Sure happened to you. You look at a pair of shoes and then the damn pair follows you around for the next three weeks. Yeah, that's called retargeting. And the reason people spend so much money on it is because the conversion rate is very high. And remember, we're all optimizing towards whether or not you buy. As long as the conversion rate in retargeting is higher, that's where the money is going to go. Um, but you see a difference, for instance, here this ad has a lot more effect as a ratio on, on prospecting. So we tested it as a negative test. If you tell me you can use predictive modeling to do causal analysis, you want to be skeptical. So the first test is, what happens if I measure the, ad, the impact of a pizza ad on signing up for telecommunication service? What should happen? Absolutely nothing. And if you find anything in there, you're doing something wrong. Doesn't mean when you find something, it's right, but this is like the first test that your method has to pass. And so here we show that in this case, indeed, the method says there's nothing going on there. We also compared it to a causal test where we run it in parallel, actually, a sequence to a formal A-B test where we had kind of classical experimental design and the methodology comes back very uh, consistently. Now, there is a silver lining here that I want to point out. Yes, the industry is optimizing towards who is going to buy. Here I'm showing you the relationship between the causal impact by a group of people versus the kind of organic conversion rate that I see for that group of people without the ad. And the good news that saves the day is that people who are more likely to buy also tend to have a higher impact. Because you can show me as many ads as you want for scrapbooking, I will never buy it. If you're not interested, you're not interested. Let's look at two more examples out of advertising. Who has been utterly disappointed with the video ads you see whenever they stream Hulu or other things? All right, welcome to my world. Why is that? I mean, it can't be so hard to make this better. This is really terrible. You see the same freaking thing 20 times within half an hour. I mean, even if it was cute the first time around, at least <laughs> at the fifth time, no matter how cute it was, it's just boring. And the reason is because in video advertising, we're still measured on in audience. And guess what? I'm the same middle-aged woman every time you show me the thing. So I count every time as in audience, which is great for the advertiser, it just sucks for me. I don't think it's very effective either. So this is an interesting problem because now if I want to play this game and if I want to maximize the in audience, who is measuring in audience? Aggregators will tell you after the fact, after you run your campaign, that you had only I don't know, 68% of the ads were shown to female and you promised 100% and then you have to make up the remaining. So what's the problem here? You could somewhat naively assume that I have to predict gender, which, I mean, gee, we're back to predicting gender. Um, all right, fine. I don't need to predict gender. I need to predict what the measurement company thinks my gender is. Actually, not even that, because the measurement company only will take a small subset of the people I showed an ad to, which is probably biased. And on this small subset, they have what the people claim to have be on Facebook. 
So I'm predicting for an unknown subset of people what the aggregate Facebook uh, self-report agenda is. That's my problem here. So forget that. What you can do, however, if you get a whole bunch of these reports, you can pool them. And if you have multiple of these aggregate statistics, you can basically create an artificial training set where you weigh them according to what the in-audience report was and build a classifier against it. And we show that you can then exceed on any arbitrary metrics, whether this is consistent with true gender or not, is completely irrelevant at the point. This method optimizes towards these metrics. Finally, two examples on data cleanliness. This is uh, data on uh, locations from Foursquare. And one of the things you need to know, everybody talks very uh, uh, kind of excitedly about hyper-local targeting and all that stuff. Turns out location data is terribly noisy. What I would love to know, when your phone says you're certain place, are you really there? Because often you're not. I never know whether you're really there without actually going and looking for you, but I don't even know who you are. I'm just knowing that the device is there. But here's some interesting observation. According to the information I'm getting, 30% of the American population travels faster than the speed of sound every day. So I'm pretty sure that this lat long information is incorrect, either the starting point or the end point or both. Another interesting observation is uh, Catalanian traditions. Any Catalanians here? No? Oh, you, you probably know about this one. People piling up in really, really high stacks. I see at the same point in time, 10,000 people at the exact same location <laughs> to the meter. I can't possibly believe that they're all there either. So chances are that information is wrong too. What I can do now is say, Sometimes I don't know whether you're there, but I'm pretty sure you're not there in certain locations. And we use that to get a classifier that predicts when lat-long information is very accurate. By the way, where do you find accurate lat-long information in kind of the uh, mobile device environment? It's all the ad requests coming from Grindr because there it matters whether you're where you uh, pre pretend to be but it's a very kind of special subpopulation, so maybe you don't want to go overboard with the hyperlocal targeting on them. Okay, so I've given you a couple of examples, and I'm very well aware that not every data problem in this world is a predictive problem, but many can benefit from predictive solutions. This being said, the data you really want, despite all the raving uh, changes uh, in the day and age of big data, is not what you have, so it comes down to figuring out ways to deal with the data that you have or you just have to be really good at cheating. Thank you very much. <laughs>